the uh, recording and the recording is on now, it looks like, just so folks are aware. Um, and so we have a pretty busy agenda, as you can see here. Um, and like I said, the PowerPoint has been dropped in the chat as well for reference for folks. Uh, so from nine until 10, we'll have OSPI updates. Uh, we'll talk about after exit proviso. We will also have an OSPI uh, question and answer from Tim McLean and uh, Becky McLean, uh, which thank you so much for being here again. Um, we really are excited uh, to, to have you as our guest here. And then we will also have our CTC Link student financials team, Brandon Reed, Tamira, and um, also Charles uh, here and possibly others too. So I just wanted to, to make note of that. Uh, we'll be doing an after exit refresher in CTC Link because it's been basically almost a full year, summer's coming. So uh, just a nice refresher on what that looks like in the process for after exit. And then we'll do, they'll have some uh, several CTC Link updates for us as well. And then we'll get into some uh, legislation updates from the legislative session of 2024. And uh, then we'll have some departmental dual credit uh, state board updates. And then finally, for our breakout session, uh, we're calling it wish list. And um, we're excited about this breakout session because we're going to ask you all what you would like to see changed, if possible, uh, with Running Start. So uh, we're trying to put together legislative asks for 2025. And so we were just curious what your wish list would be. And so we would actually open it up, not just even Running Start, any dual credit. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward to that breakout session today and to, to hear what folks have uh, to, to share. And then we'll do some uh, feedback collection and closing shares, and that'll be our day. And I did wanna make an, an important note, Jamie Traugott is not joining us today. Um, she is out of the office, but will be back in action uh, in April, our, our awesome uh, director of dual enrollment at the state board, or her dual credit at the state board. And um, on that note, I did want to make an important note that our April um, series was moved to April 30th, uh, and that is on the last slide here, so we'll have an, an update on that. It is the same link, but we moved the the next uh, series, uh, number four, to April 30th, two to four. And then we also added an additional uh, series um, for June. So we have one in May, and then we'll have one in June as well, June 11th, uh, nine to 11. And again, that is on the last slide here, and we'll, we'll um, mention that at the end as well. I just wanted to make sure if folks have to jump off for other meetings that they do hear that information. All right. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Tim McLean, our uh, uh, Director of Dual uh, Credit Supervisor at, the C um, at OSPI, thank you. Stephanie, um, so thanks for having us today. Um, we don't have a lot that probably hasn't been shared previously. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend your last uh, meeting, but um, in the way of updates, I wanted to advise everybody that we currently have under review our running, our summer running start bulletin. You might recall something similar from last year. Um, went out a little bit later because we had a long legislative session. So uh, fortunately, that'll be coming out sooner than it did last year. A lot of the information's already been shared because of the demand for the uh, for the forms. So what you'll see reflected in the Running Start Bulletin, I think, is largely consistent with forms you've already seen and conversations sure. we've already had. Um, but it is going to differentiate a little bit better I, for you, I think, the, the distinctions between what I'm calling standard Running Start and is outlined therein as standard Running Start and after exit enrollment. Um, so that bulletin is currently in our review channels internally and should be coming out. Well, I, I hesitate <laughs> to suggest what it could be coming out uh, given people's availability, but it is done uh, for what it's worth. And it's been reviewed by SBCTC. So if you have any questions, you're, you're welcome to run them by me or Stephanie or Jamie upon her return. Um, so that is coming, and it's also going to pack be packaged with other um, forms that we have touched on previously. So um, on the 8th, if you missed it, it was a couple weeks back now, we did um, release through the listserv, both um, SBCTCs and OSPIs, the Declaration of Intent for after-exit uh, enrollment that is predominantly 
for use by high schools to identify and confirm the eligibility of students uh, wishing to participate as after exit students, distinct again from standard student um, enrollment. And um, we also put out the after exit assurances for the colleges. Um, so when you receive and enroll those students who have been deemed eligible at their high school, um, you are going to run, like last year, an enrollment report out of CTC Link and attach to it those after exit assurances, just uh, confirming that for your parts, you have confirmed those students' eligibility. Uh, so those are both out. They went out through the listserv. They are also on our website if you missed it. Um, so all of the summer forms at this point are updated and posted on the website. Um, particularly, they are on the dual credit, the course-based dual credit website, not the main landing page where you might navigate to for other resources. Um, so those are out. I referenced before some of the other things that were posted on the website, the dual credit updates uh, bulletin went out on the 13th of February, that's up. Um, we had the summer RSEVF, which I assume many of you are already using. Um, we put these forms out as early as we could because we knew they were gonna be needed for registration mm -hmm. season. So again, these will all be incorporated into the bulletin that is coming, but they're already out there for public consumption. So you're probably using them. I'd also remind you of the running start calculator that was included in one of our earlier news briefs um, or news flashes and the RS, RS EVF tutorial um, that we have put out now on multiple occasions through our channels to the districts. Um, we are currently in interviews for the high school and beyond plan finalists. That's a lot. <laughs> Um, we're, we have uh, seven finalists. We did two of them on Monday. Um, it is a lot of information to take in, and we have five of them tomorrow. Uh, so we have a full day of interviews, but it is exciting work. Um, the capabilities of this platform are not to be undersold. Uh, so look forward to more information coming. I don't know the exact timeline. I think June is when decisions need to be announced publicly. Um, so stay tuned for more on that. And just a quick refresher on after exit and one addition that may not have been discussed in your last meeting. Um, I, I just want to be clear after exit is expanded this year to include not only graduates, but also non-graduates. In the graduate category, um, we are talking about students who have graduated, are within 15 credits of an AA degree. Um, you do not need to apply FTE calculations to this group. Um, they are graduating, therefore the, the FTE um, does not need to be met, and that is the way that the proviso was written. Um, so we have loosened that up from last year when you might recall that we were um, adhering to an expectation that um, graduating students had met the FTE limit. That is no longer the case. Um, and I actually found out I didn't know they were changing this through the legislative process. They did change the proviso language to make this all clearer. Um, it was by and large a matter of interpretation in past years. It's a lot clearer this year. So graduating seniors within 15 credits may take those courses that will get them to the AA degree, not more, um, and not courses that are not applicable to completion. It is up to 15 credits, and they are only credits that are associated with the AA. Um, the other group, uh, turning to non-graduates, we have non-graduate students who have exceeded enrollment limitations. And we added a new or to this because that could be your traditional um, juniors and first year seniors who took essentially 21 credits um, through all the terms and maximized their 1.4. They don't have credit available in the summer. They can participate through running start um, after exit running start. And then uh, a wrinkle came up. Thank you, Stephanie, for elevating it. 
And that had to do with current fifth-year seniors. Current fifth-year seniors, as you know, are limited to 63 credits now with the with the 1.4 increase over all of their senior years combined. We have interpreted after exit to suggest that they too have met an enrollment limit, thereby allowing non-graduating fifth year seniors to, act, to access after exit funds if they have now exhausted their multi-year 63 credit maximum. Um, so that's a new wrinkle that may not have been discussed last time. Um, the non-graduating student populations are eligible for 10 credits. The 15 credit limit is very clearly specified with regard to the AA, not the rest of the students. So we're trying to maintain consistency with standard running start, where there is also a maximum of 10 credits. Um, so all of these student groups that are non-grad, or not all, these two student groups of non-graduates are limited to 10 credits. Um, fifth year seniors, those who have maximized their enrollment over multiple years, they do, they are still fifth year seniors and do need to be taking courses that are applicable to high school graduation requirements. They don't have carte blanche. Non-graduating students, student, did I just say students? I did say students. <laughs> Non-graduating students. Um, do uh, do have more flexibility. So that is the update. And I am embarrassed that this is being recorded, but thank you. And then Tim, it does look like we have some questions. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move the slide to our Q&A uh, to include Becky in here. And so let's see, there's two in the chat here so far. Uh, how can we help our high school partners sign up for these OSPI bulletins? Is there a link? Uh, there, there's a, a link um, on the top right-hand corner of our main landing page. Dual, I'll, I'll drop the link in the chat when I'm done talking, but it's the dual credit programs page. Um, we are, I think, north of like 2,000 subscribers at this point, so it is gaining momentum, um, but absolutely in your presentations and in conversations with your K-12 partners, direct them to that link in the top um, right corner of our website. It also goes out in most of our publications at this point. Um, for those who are new to the, to the field or new to the system, that's a recent development, so we have been, you know, really trying to to generate interest in it. We only established it this year. Um, and so that's where you can find it. We also we are also doing graduate team um, uh, office hours much like this um, in which I'm presenting on a monthly basis to our partners. And that link is highlighted in those presentations as well. Wonderful, thank you, Tim. And then we have another question. I believe Kaylee just, uh, actually, thank you, Kaylee dropped in the chat. Uh, a link to to sign up for the listserv uh, listserv is under dual credit updates. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, back to Grace's question. Uh, to clarify, there is no after exit funding for graduating seniors who are not within fifteen credits of a degree. Correct. For example, a student who only did running start their senior year but is going to continue at the community college. That's correct. Um, that no. that's that's one of the few groups at this juncture um, with after exit that. Uh, are still unaccounted for. So if they're not within 15 credits of a degree, but they are graduating, um, then th there's not funding available to them. Otherwise, it's occurred to me as I've continued to process after exit that there's really not a student population except th that in this summer specifically that doesn't have some road to summer running start. But yes, that is one of those. Um, and, and I want to be clear that the after exit is likely terminal. So uh, really important to note is the fact that I'm not sure, none of us are, whether the after exit proviso will continue in future years. So as you're working with students, um, acknowledging that that is the case is important. Um, this is funded by a proviso. It's a year-to-year -year proviso. This At this point is the last year in which it is in play. And I think it was initially drafted 
when we were still under a 1.2 and there were greater limitations and fewer options for achieving an AA degree with the extension to a 1.4 and the opportunity for students to take upwards, well, up to 63 credits over the course of a year. Um, I don't see this proviso persisting. Um, if it does, it may be more limited in scope. Um, but I think that what the legislature did last year was really intended to make this obsolete. So keep that in mind as you're talking to students. Yes, thank you, Tim. Okay, and another question for clarification, can incoming seniors utilize summer quarter at a max of 10 credits like the incoming juniors, sophomores? Incoming seniors, in other words, those who have not participated in Running Start previously, yes. Uh, Becky, correct me if I'm misunderstanding the question, but uh, a student who, who wishes to begin Running Start in the summer is permitted to do that. In fact, they would have the FTE capacity to do that. And we view summer running start as an extension of the prior uh, of the current school year. I agree. As long as they have available AFT by June, which they would because they haven't participated in running start um, during the standard school year. Thank you and great question. And then we just had a request to um, to mute uh, yourselves, um, just so that there's no background fuzziness. Thank you, Dana. I appreciate that request. And then uh, let's see, question about keeping the high school record open for after exit students. Is that up to the high school to do, or is there so anything we should do? Is it okay, funding and eligibility wise, if the record is not kept open, if the student doesn't need the credits transcribed? I don't think there's anything to do on your part except kind of talk the students through the the repercussions um, if you are counseling them in any in any form or fashion. Um, it is up to the school to do. We have various checkpoints through which they are being notified that that is best practice. There are circumstances in which a student might not care to keep their record open. So if they are graduating and, and they feel um, that it is incumbent upon them to be graduated, not show continued enrollment through the summer, for instance, they're in a highly competitive situation in which they need a formal transcript, uh, then it is their discretion to say, no, I want my, my, my record closed. I want to be graduated so I can get those transcripts off to these selective schools. So be it. Um, they just need to know that they will still attain the credits. They will still be reflected on the college transcript, but they're not going to reflect on the high school transcript. Um, there, it, it is just a limitation in our system that cannot be changed. That once you close a student record, you cannot retroactively um, address it. So. I wouldn't even say it is the high school's determination it is really up to the student as to what they want to do. And that needs to be communicated to the high school. If they leave their transcript open, number one, those credits can be transcribed so they can be awarded. They can also, if graduated with an AA degree, that can be reflected on the transcript. So there are benefits to leaving it open and they are still acknowledged as class of 2024. It, the only significance is one, they will have an official transcript at the time that it's needed um, if they close it. And two, um, Maybe I they will show an earlier graduation date, mm -hmm. but the graduation year does not is not influenced by the decision. So they will still look like a graduate of 2024. It will just have a graduation date of August. Wonderful, thank you, Tim. And we had uh, a comment just saying, thank you very much. That was very helpful. All right, a couple other questions here. Let's see, uh, does the after exit apply to other associate degrees besides the AA, specifically the associate of science degrees? And the answer would be yes to that. 
Um, I'll take that on. And then the one thing though that I would would note is once the student earns an associate's degree, they then are eligible for further associate's degrees. So that's something just to keep in mind um, uh, as as you're um, advising students. Yeah, and okay. a point and of I'm sorry, a okay. point of clarification on that is that after exit is applicable to their first associate degree. So if they, so Stephanie just mentioned, if they've already earned an associate degree, it, it's not for the second, it's for the first. And, and we, I think, underline that in the bulletin um, because that question has come up a few times. Thank you, Tim, perfect. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, another question, confirm please uh, a homeschool senior who is earning high school diploma uh, from earning the AA cannot do after exit for 15 credits, but they are eligible for the 10 credits as non-graduating seniors for 10 credits, correct? Well, that, not looking for someone. That also gives Instead of maxed out their enrollment, yes. Um, I think there's supposed to be a not in that question, a, a homeschool student who is not earning a high school diploma. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's how I would read that, yeah. Um, if they are if they are not pursuing a high school okay. diploma, they therefore cannot be graduated. Um, so yeah, they would be eligible for the ten credits, provided they exceed they met or exceeded their available AAFT. Yeah, and sorry, a point of clarification there too, Tim, is they would be getting awarded the high school diploma by earning an AA degree. So what you said is is correct. Then, thank you. Okay, moving on. Um, we had another question from our high school partner. What if a counselor filled out the summer EVF to the best of their ability, but there was an error? Would the student have to pay tuition if that's the case? Or would the district and college work out corrections so the student isn't penalized? It's a really good question. Tim, do you want me to take this? So, so if the summer money start was a uh, form was filled out incorrectly and the student would be exceeding the 1.4 AFTE um, for whatever, uh, you know, they would be exceeding it. The district can't claim the student for more than what's allowed. And so therefore, uh, if, you know, the college may need to collect tuition for anything that was uh, not allowed to be claimed or the district, if they had the capacity to, to um, I don't even know, to pay the tuition for the student. They couldn't claim it for state funding, but if the district had a way to re, uh, compensate the college, um, that could be allowed. But if, if all else, then yes, tuition would need to be due to the student. I think that question is dependent upon when the error is realized. Um, if it's realized early enough, then a correction to the RSEVF could be made. Um, but if it was after the point of completion, um, Becky, I, I think what I'm hearing you say is there's not a there's not a means of retroactively adjusting at the point of payment. Is that correct? Correct. The student students enrollment couldn't be claimed for anything over a 1.4 AFTE. Um, so no state funds would ge be generated for anything above that. And so yes, then the college and the district would need to work out a way to to either um, to, to pay to compensate the extra FT that can't be complained, uh, claimed. All right, thank you, Becky. And then Michelle Johnson, I see that you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, I actually just had a follow-up question to Jane's previous questions about um, homeschooling seniors who are getting their high school diploma through the college. Um, I just wanted to clarify. So when we're thinking not after exit funding or thinking specifically AAFTE, um, let's say for example, the homeschool student is getting their high school diploma through the college and um, you know, have FTE remaining for the summer, so they haven't completed their degree or their high school diploma yet, they can use their FTE, 
in the summer after they graduate or they were meant to graduate to com to complete their degree, correct? Tim, did you want me to take that one? Or were you thinking through it? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm processing. Okay. So, I mean, if, if they have available FTE, then yes, they, they would go through the process as a standard running start summer running start student they would apply the fte um and and yes i mean that that would be fine um if they had not exceeded their fte yeah yeah they, i think i think it's a, i think it's a fairly straightforward answer yes they, if they have fte they they can apply it in the summertime yes Okay. Yeah, um, just not like through the after exit proviso. It's just correct. Like, they like, they would go through standard. Um, but your question brought up to mind something um, that I think is important to address. I'm, I might need to circle back to the bulletin and address it um, better there. Uh, one question that's come up is if a student has remaining FTE and they go into the summer, so let's suppose they they only have FTE remaining for five credits. Can they then apply five credits as a standard student and then say, I maxed out, I'm going to max out, and now I want to be eligible for after exit? No, we can't like um preemptively say you're going to apply you're going to be eligible for after exit. So you can't split. Um, it's an important note to make. You can't say, oh, well, they have five credits available as a as a standard summer running start student and then we'll get the 15 as a as potentially that'll get them to graduation and then we'll take the 15 after exit you can't mishmash and, and i get that that kind of feels icky when you have students you know who only are qualified for one course in the summer but them's the breaks you know and just um we can't be we can't split funds and we can't assume that a student is going to complete and therefore max out or enroll and therefore max out. So we can't preemptively guess at those things. You go into the summer where you are at the end of the spring. Thank you guys. All right, we've got another question in the chat. Uh, this might have already been addressed, but are we completing the monthly enrollment reports, MP223s, and sending them out still, even if the districts and high school counselors are out for the summer, during the summer months specifically? Zach, you are welcome to piggyback. Um, I, I yeah. Oh, you go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, ideally, yes. Um, we've communicated, and, and this is now the second year that we've done this um, to scale, that, that the best practice is that the high schools or district will be doing the P223s throughout the summer. There will be situations in which there is not capacity to do that. Um, it does delay payment. We understand that. Um, but in a in a perfect world, we we would have them doing the P223s uh, monthly throughout the summer. Um, and, and that's better addressed in the bulletin. Um, but if it is not done um, because of capacity issues, it will delay payment, if I'm not mistaken, to January. Becky, is that correct? So, yes. Yeah, so ideally, districts should be processing their monthly P223s for July and August in the month that they receive. And if they get the enrollment in by, it's usually around the 18th of those months, the funding will be generated in the, the district's apportionment for that month. Um, but if they don't, and they wait till I think it's August 19th to, um, so we pull the enrollment for uh, the, the year, I believe it's around August 19th, and that's how we run the August portion. Um, and then after that, district can continue to report enrollment up until around Thanksgiving. Again, I don't know the actual date. I think it's November 22nd or something. And at that point, we pulled the enrollment, and all that enrollment will show up as uh, funding in the January's portion. So, yes, there is a delay. 
I'm happy to jump on Megan's question because I, I know it's a point of consternation um, for both both of our um, constituents. No, th there's nothing in statute that requires um, there to be staffing for this purpose, and there was no funding um, generated by the proviso um, or the legislative change to do that. We've been strongly advocating for some support and what support we can provide. We did through some grant funding. Um, our Consolidated Equity and Sustainability Grant does allow for districts to request funding for summer staff. Um, there is also the question of the 7% that districts retain for running start purposes. Um, many districts have reabsorbed that funding to account for summer, and, and that's caused its own challenges at the local level because high school counselors used to see some of that funding and they are not anymore because the district district is retaining it. So to answer the question simply, no. Um, there is no funding to provide additional capacity in the summer. There was no mandate to provide additional capacity in the summer, and our districts are struggling mightily with that. The best advice that I can give is, is maintain open lines of communication and have those tough conversations about how the process will be run. Um, it may shift to a district office because districts typically are staffed through the summer as opposed to the buildings, but there's very little we can do to account or force anybody's hand to staff up at the building level with counselors in the summer months. Many of them are on collective bargaining agreements, much like those of you at colleges. We simply can't tell them to do something without funding it and without oftentimes having a legislative mandate to do it. So it's it's challenging. It's disappointing for, for both sides, I think. Um, but I would just beg you to bear in mind that as you're struggling with some of these issues, um, this process is extremely taxing. <laughs> <laughs> for those of us in K-12. It it's a it's an unfunded mandate. Um and and it's applicable to people that don't work in the summers. <laughs> that that's the reality that we're faced with. So especially a cup. Yep. I'm sorry, I just want to ask a follow-up question. I totally a hundred percent understand all it, being not funded. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> um what if just even just practically, Tim, um, what would your advice be to have that conversation with the district office? Because I think that that would probably be our line of yeah. practice. Like, who should we start with at the district office to have that conversation to say somebody needs to be trained on these forms so that we're serving students? You know what I mean? Yeah, I might start with the registrar. Okay. That that would be my natural starting point um depending on the size of the district there's not likely to be at many districts a person that's solely responsible for dual credit um their their responsibilities are usually spread out but the registrar or the district business office and becky if you have another idea let me know um but the registrar for the purpose of forms in the business office for the purpose of P223s. And if you can get them both in the same room or on the same Zoom call, um, that might kill two birds with one stone. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. So there is somebody at the district office, depending on the size of the office, that is actually completing the P223. It's usually, it's a district form. A small district, it would probably be the business office. Sometimes it's their student information department. But maybe those folks, um, they would be the one to pick up um, when uh, the the work for when the the high school might be closed, so again, depending on the size of the district, the business officer or the student information um, person, uh, basically the person that submits their P two two three for the whole school year. And Becky, is that person generally? I'm trying to picture the P two two three in my head. Um, if the college looked at P223s, would they know who that person is? Or does the P223? I done mute. Um, yeah. No, the colleges may be, they could be sending the P223 
RS to either the business office or to the high school and the high school may be reviewing it and sending it on to the business office. There's somebody that actually at the district office that's actually inputting the, the, the numbers for all the high schools into the actual form. And that's who you probably need to get a hold of. Would they be the one to be able to do what the registrar is doing, which is maybe matching the RSV, the running start verification form against the what's being reported? I, I don't know, but maybe that paperwork that is done during the school year at the registrar could be forwarded to whomever is um, available in the summer at the district office to do that lift, to do that work that's typically done during the standard school. that help? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and read Christina's question. Are we able to set a flexible deadline to get students through before high school administrators leave for summer to avoid confusion uh, with students and their families minimizing workload and creating errors in our record keeping? Yes. And I encourage you to do so because you as colleges are the ones that can set said deadlines. Um, it's very clear in our guidance and I think even in statute that high schools can't. That's one of the big challenges. We have deferred very much to the colleges and their enrollment deadlines to say students may enroll in Running Start up until said point in the college's calendar, which creates some of that that difficulty, right? Because the college's calendar doesn't sync with the high schools. So it's actually the high schools that are often complaining and saying, can we set a deadline? And my answer to them is, nope, you can't. Um, they would love to set a deadline that by June 5th, you are registered and ready for running start. They can't. You can. Um, so absolutely. All right, any last minute questions for Tim and Becky? Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Tim and Becky, for being on our call today and your partnership and collaboration. It's really been wonderful working with you both. And we really appreciate the time this morning um, that you've taken to um, graciously present and then also answer a lot, all of our questions that we've had. So thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Wonderful. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on to After Exit, a CTC Link refresher. And I have the pleasure of introducing Brandon Reed, our Student Financials Associate Director, and his wonderful team. Uh, so go ahead, Brandon. I'm going to go ahead and turn it on over to you. And thank you for being here today. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, just, uh, you know, working from last year's After Exit uh, processing. We are continuing essentially uh, the, the, the same type of uh, CTC link functionality uh, availability for everyone to use. Uh, that is primarily through the positive service indicator process. And that is the, the service indicator of BAE. And so the after exit funded students will be, will have one of those um, service indicators assigned for the term that is associated with their enrollment. And then at the point of uh, invoicing and at the point of uh, needing to, uh, you know, be repaid for the students, the, uh, you know, running a particular query that will show you who all has enrollment, who all has the BAE service indicator, um, that will be how you review your RS billing uh, report and then uh, get that over to the, uh, for reimbursement to OSPI. We do have a, uh, a QRG that's associated with this process that has been up updated since last year. And if you have any questions on, um, you know, there's uh, the, the, the CTC Link Reference Center has quite a bit of information in it, including uh, this, that particular link and information on a, a, the AEF program. Um, please feel free to do some searching if you don't know how to um, 
uh, add a, a service indicator. Uh, and so that information is all out there. Uh, with regards to the query that you're able to run, that is uh, also available in, in the production environment. That's on the next little slide there, Stephanie. And so here uh, you'll see the name of the, the the report, and just one main, you know, ask that students will not show on the report if they don't have both the service indicator and the enrollment. And so that is going to be the 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 main tracking mechanism for uh, for this process. And uh, as I mentioned prior, after having this information, you will be able to validate that against the information that is contained within the RS billing report and uh, extract that out of the RS billing in order to, to send out to OSPI for reimbursement. And so, yes, please feel free. Uh, definitely take a look at the, the Reference Center link to the QRG on this process. Uh, you can always reach uh, us here at the state board and the student financials team at the SF support at sbctc.edu. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, we're always available. And does anyone have any questions about after exit in CTC link? And thank you so much, Brandon. This was great to have these two slides on here. And just a refresher, it is the same process as last year, as Tim has mentioned, as Brandon has mentioned. Are there any questions about the process, deadlines? Um, again, it's it's the same uh, for after exit as last year. All right, we will go ahead and move on then, Brandon. I will switch on to the next slide here. Yeah, and in, in working with uh, Stephanie and Jamie, uh, they, they had some wonderful ideas on, on some additional fields and information to include on that uh, that famous RS billing report out of CTC Link. And so the, the next time that you run it, you will see uh, quarterly GPA, the student's class section, the cumulative earned credit, and the cumulative GPA all listed. Um, the class section is near the course information, kind of towards the, uh, the middle of the report, whereas the remaining added new fields are towards the end uh, on that spreadsheet. So please uh, take a look there, and uh, we look forward to uh, doing everything we can to, to uh, accommodate any improvements to that, uh, that report. Again, the, the idea behind this uh, this standard main report is that it is the the holder of all information. Um, if your institution has the uh, need or the desire to filter it down, your query writers can take the that information and, and, and mold it into a uh, a different report for you personally to run. So please keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that uh, with the discussion of this RS uh, billing. Uh, improvements. Uh, we have uh, started the task of trying to mimic the actual P223 uh, report um, out of CTC link so that it will be a what's called a BI publisher report that will pull the information that's contained on the P223 as it is currently and provide that similar looking uh, uh, Mimic, mimic mimicking the P223 as it as it looks now. And so we have gotten some um, some good feedback already, both from uh, Stephanie and Jamie, uh, but also from the reporting team with um, positive uh, remarks on, on on making this happen. And so hopefully within the next month, we'll have some more news to share with regards to a, a possible brand new uh, uh, you know, report for you. So please be on the lookout for that. And lastly, we have uh, added a grade level in onto the uh, the student running start page. As you all know, the running start has a custom page that was developed in order to track and, and process and, and, and function for the system. And so we were able to, in the test environment, this is the PCD environment currently, have that additional grade level uh, added so that it may be um, selected and, and utilized. 
And so this is, you know, associated with uh, the bill that was passed recently, which uh, Stephanie will go into here shortly. Um, and so I just, we wanted to let you all know that it has been turned on in the PCD environment. And, uh, you know, we do anticipate this uh, being turned on for everyone in the production environment uh, here in the upcoming weeks. And we'll let you all know when it is available. Thank you so much, Brandon. And thank you to your team. You all are just rock stars and we're so uh, grateful to you all. Um, so yeah, so this just to, just what Brandon had said, uh, now that we have our rising juniors uh, eligible for running start, this will this way you can identify uh, in CTC link for summer uh, between sophomore and junior year that they're tenth graders. So that's what we had. Um, decided um, would be the best um, way to go about that. Cause I know we had our conversation last series. Um, this had come up about how there was, you know, what do we choose? Is it 11th grade? Uh, is it blank? So 10th grade is what we're going to go with. Um, so thank you so much, Brandon. And then kind of going back to what Brandon had shared about all the amazing things his team is doing, um, him and his team are doing about the Running Star Billing Report. Again, just to reiterate, we took the feedback you all gave us from our, our last session and had some conversations and, and did a lot of behind the scenes work. And so just really excited to, to be able to use that Running Start Billing Report to pull, pull all kinds of information for you all. So you can utilize it in several different ways and then creating something as you all had suggested um, that's specific for the P223 report to make everyone's lives a little bit easier uh, and less work. So uh, as, as Brandon had mentioned, stay tuned for, for more updates on that. Um, but I'm gonna, we're gonna go ahead and if it's okay with you, Brandon, just open it up to any general questions um, and, and comments. And I see that uh, Jean has said something down below. Any thoughts on adding box to indicate flag students who are at multiple colleges? Um, we have not had that conversation that I am aware of, Brandon, but let me know if I'm missing something here, but that's something I can certainly jot down as a note. Yes, please definitely, please jot that down. That's a, that's a very interesting one to see if um, it, Maybe that that could be a tough ask, uh, but we can work with our reporting team and internally and and, and see what uh, we can come back with. Though that's a that's, a, that's very interesting. That's, that's that's a good question. Yep, and then Jean just had a, a, a comment to add on to that. Great to track or have query to see those at multiple colleges and where they're enrolled and credits at each college. High school counselor very confused with multiple colleges. Agreed, depending on where you're at, too. <laughs> yes, right. thank you. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, we'll have an answer for you uh, next time for sure, if not before. All right, other questions, comments? Hi, um, I just had a, a quick question. Uh, we, we talked about this at some of the previous meetings, and it would be in regards to um, if the student running start page would auto populate the prior information from a previous term. I don't know if that was something that was being looked at or if you discussed that already. So you're, you're thinking that that on that custom page, being able to kind of navigate between terms within the page instead of uh, prior to it. Yeah, something something kind of like how the student group page works, where like if you you know add another row, all the information is populated, you would just change it. Something because that might um, help decrease the amount of um, manual processing for these forms. Having the you know look, it just it's just a little bit of extra you know time that it takes, um, but it'd probably be more helpful to either add a row or the information would pop you know auto populate for. For each quarter so i'm not constantly putting okay they're in this school they're at olympic you know school district olympic high school they're in 11th grade and it would just populate from the previous quarter um and then, then we would just have to be mindful the next year would have to change the grade to from 11th to 12th or you know etc but i wasn't sure if that was being talked about or it would just probably be a helpful suggestion there there is a job that runs that copies the school and grade information from quarter to quarter the only thing it doesn't do is when it comes time for the, you know, next year, it doesn't raise the, the grade level up. So you do have to go in and change the grade level for the juniors to the to the seniors. But there is there's a job or whatever that you can run. It copies the high school information. Into the student running start page? Yes. 
Oh, yeah. Okay. Heather, I think you're referring to the um, Running Start High School data role. Um, and if that's the case, I've got the QRG pulled up and I'll put that in the uh, chat for you guys. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, I know that there's a couple uh, questions here or comments. Oh yeah, like, yep, like, okay, kind of the same thing, like having the grade level increase each year and not having to do the manual high school role. Yes, we have, um, Hillary, we have talked about that piece and I'll, I'll make sure to elevate that back onto our priority list um, of, of conversations with Brandon and team. Okay, other questions or comments? Okay, yes, there's one here, let's see, okay. Uh, just to confirm, do the colleges submit after exit enrollment to OSPI? If so, do we send those again to Becky McLean? Also, is the last session recorded and available? Yes, thank you. Um, so yes, the colleges submit, just like last year, submit the after exit enrollment to OSPI directly. Um, and I believe it goes directly to Becky. Uh, the reason I'm pausing on that is because, as Tim had mentioned earlier today, there is going to be a bulletin that goes out. And I've seen kind of a rough draft of it. And I believe it says to go to Becky. I just can't remember off the top of my head right now. So stay tuned for that. Um, that information will be available hopefully soon um, as to who exactly it will go to at OSPI. But I, I would assume it's Becky. Um, and then is the last session recorded and available? Yes, it is. Absolutely. And um, maybe I can ask Kaylee to drop in. We have our uh, dual credit state board for community technical colleges playlist on YouTube now. And so we're going to be posting. We already have the first two uh, of the series posted there for reference. And so we will be putting this one up as well. Uh, the first hour of, of the information before we do the breakout sessions. So thank you. Great. I appreciate the question. Last year was a long time ago. Yes. <laughs> it's hard to remember. <laughs> Thank you, Kaylee. Kaylee just dropped in the YouTube link um, for our dual credit page where we'll be posting all our videos there. All right. Other questions for Brandon and team. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brandon. Um, you and your team are so amazing. We're so appreciative of you, for you. And um, I look forward to, to working with you more on all of these amazing details and projects that we've got going on. Yes, uh, we we the same. And uh, thank you all for doing what you do on this amazing program. Uh, we will look forward to hearing what comes about from the next hour. And we'll, we'll see you next time. All right. Sounds great. Thank you so much. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on here. So uh, just a quick update, uh, legislation, uh, legislative session of 2024, the bills that were passed. Uh, we, we've we mentioned, Jamie, I believe, mentioned these last time, and we've been keeping an eye on them. So uh, just a quick note, House Bill 1146, the notifying high school students and their families about available dual credit programs and any available financial assistance that did pass. Uh, and then also uh, SB 5670, that's the one that's um, permitting 10th grade students to participate in Running Start in online settings uh, and providing uh, summer Running Start for rising juniors. So the, the online setting piece got scratched, but um, the the it did get past the portion, it basically got in statute that 10th grade um, rising juniors um, can access Running Start. So that's what that, that bill is going to do, which is great. All right, um, we're gonna move on here. So uh, uh, departmental updates for the State Board Dual Credit. Um, I got a couple updates for everybody. So uh, as Jamie mentioned last time, uh, the Running Start Residency Waiver and RCW change. So as you all, all of you Running Start experts statewide know, Residency and Running Start is always a hot topic and kind of a mess. <laughs> and so um, we had put together a work group um, that uh, consisted of, uh, registrars, enrollment folks, uh, running start experts uh, statewide, and just to figure out how, what we can do to um, some ARC members to try to see what we can do to uh, come up with some solutions. And so there were two um, basically outcomes. Uh, one was to create a running start residency waiver. And then the other was to look at an RCW change. 
And so unfortunately, I think Jamie updated this last time, the RCW change, it was too late to get that uh, effective in this ledge session. So we're going to very much push that for next ledge session. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we have asked, uh, we, we took the waiver idea to uh, WACTC, the presidents basically, our CTC presidents, and they voted to pass it. And now, uh, right now we are waiting for the State Board of Trustees meeting March 28th to approve and move the waiver forward. We don't anticipate any problems. Uh, once approved, work on uh, we'll be working on our back end to provide the guidance on what this is all gonna look like. And um, we hope to present this as soon as our next uh, series in April, so April 30th. So I just wanted to give a quick quick update on the waiver for Running Start and, and just to Running Start Residency and just to kind of uh, explain that a little bit. And we gotta we would have to work out the logistics obviously, but um, we would basically put a waiver on all Running Start students. So their tuition and everything would act like they're an in-state resident is what we would be attempting to do. So that's exciting. Um, so so uh, more details to come on that. I just wanted to provide a quick update. Um, running Start summer count and reimbursement. So again, uh, Jamie had brought this up last time, and, and this has been an ongoing issue since um, legislative, legislative se session last year and summer Running Start passed. There was a discrepancy in the count, right? So there, there's a, a lot, there's only two count dates for summer. And so what we had proposed this ledge session was enhanced funding for the two counts. So OSPI put in um, to the legislator that we would be funded 150% for the two counts to make up for not having that third count date. Uh, and the legislature only approved 130%. So not quite what we were hoping for, but it is a step in the right direction. Uh, a lot of things went unfunded this time. So we're going to pursue a large dual credit bill next session, our big leg, leg session coming up in 2025 to include that running start RCW that I just mentioned and also um, the reimbursement count and uh, hopefully providing some more college and high school language and CTE dual credit topics in there as well. So um, lots coming up, we're excited about it. I just wanted to provide some updates on those pieces um, and that will feed nicely also into our breakout sessions in a minute because we're gonna ask for wish lists items because this is the time to start thinking about what we wanna propose for leg, leg session for next year next year, 2025. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to, to note is our math placement grant that we have. Um, so, and, and I know that I've been giving regular updates about this. So we have a generous uh, math placement grant through College Spark. And we've had uh, three or two convenings so far. We had one uh, in November of 2023 at Wenatchee Valley College. And we had a virtual one in January. And we have our upcoming math placement convening at Tacoma Community College, uh, which will be held April 25th, uh, 9 to 3. And registration closes this Friday, March 22nd. I invite everyone to attend who is interested in math placement. Um, and it, we have actually opened up to accept pilot colleges at this time. So even if you have not been involved in this work up to this point, please join us. You're welcome to, to attend, um, to find, uh, to learn more information. Basically what we're trying to do is make uh, placement uh, practices across the board at our CTCs statewide equitable as possible for students. And so I know I mentioned this um, uh, maybe last time or the, the first series, but, um, you know, if you, you know, we basically want to take high school transcripts and be able to have the same placement regardless of what CTC you go to for a student based on their high school transcripts. So right now we're looking at high school transcripts placement specifically, but um, it's great because these math placement convenings and this math placement grant has opened up the conversation statewide about what placement looks like. So directed self-placement has been part of our conversation, guided self-placement. And so if you have any interest in in placement practices, um, please join us. We would we would welcome you. Um, and the registration link is in the PowerPoint. And when I say join as a pilot college, we're looking for uh, colleges. We do have several colleges on board. We are looking for additional colleges to uh, join in utilizing our uh, high school transcript grid that we've created, placement grid that we've created, we're calling it a grid, um, to, um, to utilize that and place place um, students starting for fall quarter 2024 advising. Um, and there is um, 
a little bit of funding that comes with that. So um, if you have any interest, please go ahead and uh, register, attend. Uh, you can reach out to me if you have uh, more specific questions and I can get you on um, our emails and, and loop you into the conversations. So I just wanted to give an update there. Um, and let me just, let me pause. Any questions about, and that was a lot of information, any questions before we go on to our breakout session?